how can international finance in institutions like the IMF and the World Bank play a more productive, stabilizing roles? Or are these institutions past their prime? David, do you want to start us off, given your role, prior role from Treasury? Sure. <clears throat> well, I think Nigel just touched on it for a minute. I, I think it's, uh, it, as, as in probably in most crises, it's a wonderful opportunity for those institutions uh, in the sense that there was some question, even just a few years ago, of their relevance, the need for them, the need for their historical missions. And I think this crisis has um, brought them to the forefront uh, when people reflect on how we got here and the, and the failures in the system and the need to respond to those failures and, uh, and the need for co global coordination. And so, uh, as uh, Rahm Emanuel says, you know, let's not let a crisis go to waste. If I'm, if I'm uh, the head of the IMF or the World Bank right now, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, now there's big challenges uh, that I think they face, and there's at least three. Uh, one is uh, the governance model. So there, there has been some shifts in the governance model, but uh, it... I think it's fair to say that the, the way those institutions are governed does not reflect the allocation of economic influence and power in the global economy. And there's going to need to be more of a shift uh, with more influence given to emerging markets, and they are demanding that. Now, the problem with influence within the context of governance is it's zero sum. And so for China and Brazil and India to get more influence, that's going to come probably at the expense of some of the smaller European countries and others. And so that's a sticky political issue, but it's going to have to change for these, th for these institutions to be effective. The second thing that's going to have to happen is there's going to have to be more clarity on their mission and what they really can do or can't do. So there's a lot of talk about early warning, which is probably a good concept. I'm skeptical whether some international, international institution can really have foreseen this, but there's a lot in prudential oversight that, that can take place. And they need to have the right resources. And there's been a big shot in the arm on resources. There probably needs to be some, some more resources. The third big challenge they have, particularly in the US, is domestic support. So I don't know what the polling data says, but I bet if you did a poll across America on how, how taxpayers feel about their budgetary dollars going to the IMF or the World Bank, it wouldn't be high. And if you took a, a poll in Congress, that would certainly be the case. So for these institutions to remain viable and important, they're going to have to have greater support from their biggest shareholder, uh, which is the United States. And that's going to require a lot of education and a lot of focus. And, and we've been pretty short on that uh, to date. Uh, Nancy and uh, Raghu, I don't know if you want well, to add anything. Well, add? Um, I, I think the, the problem of governance is, is certainly one of, of votes to some extent, but it goes beyond that. It goes to the point of whether the IMF, uh, for example, uh, can have any influence over large country policies. Sure, you can get China and Brazil and India into the governance structure, but currently, they're ignoring the IMF, as does the United States, as does Europe. And they'll continue ignoring the IMF when it sounds warnings. Uh, uh, to tell you the truth, we sounded warnings about, about Eastern Europe in 2006. And the European countries, the Western European countries, sat on the IMF to keep quiet about it, saying, look, this is not a big deal. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a bad problem, because we see the problem now. Uh, early warning systems are good. Uh, they're not. Uh, as, as David said, sometimes it's hard to get the right early warning out. You probably get a lot of false alarms. But it's also a question of whether you actually pay attention to the early warnings when they come out. Who is going to bell the cat? Who is going to actually make changes in policy? Uh, at the current moment, if the IMF were to come to the United States and say, here's how we think you should restructure your financial system, they, they'd get a polite uh, hearing. Uh, and there'll be smiles all over, they'd shake hands, and everybody would go back to doing what they do. Uh, they ha the IMF has no influence over large country policies. Uh, it, it had some influence over emerging market policies, but emerging markets, once they found out they could build their own reserves uh, and did not need to borrow from the IMF anymore, said, we're in the same position as the industrial countries. We can afford to ignore the IMF. I think the change in governance is good, because on the one hand, it makes the emerging markets accept some greater degree of responsibility. But until industrial countries subject their policies to some extent, I, I, I don't have any illusion that, uh, that the IMF will have influence uh, in a big way, but unless they're willing to listen to the IMF and say, we listened and therefore we're making this and such changes, the emerging markets are never gonna show up and say, 
we're going to reduce our focus on export-led growth in any way because the IMF told us. So I think there is a need, and this was the point I was trying to make initially, there is a great need for greater global dialogue because the alternative is protectionism and a descent to beggar thy neighbor strategies which we had during the depression. There's still a small danger of that uh, over this recession. But I think that to have this global dialogue mediated by an institution like the IMF, countries have to be willing to listen a little bit. And right now, I don't think we have that situation. Uh, l let me add to that, just uh, really enhancing and elaborating on some of the things that Dave and Raghu said, as well as Nigel. First, on the problem of disciplining uh, the major countries, we have to be aware it's the US and China, primarily, uh, and a few other reserve countries. And we have to create, in the context of the IMF, take away the incentive for the surplus reserve countries to be accumulating reserves by having more collective insurance at the IMF. And a trillion dollars is a start, but there really isn't much thinking yet about what is the right number uh, and how much of it should be on hand to an institution like the IMF when needed versus how much has to be sitting there uh, ready. The U.S. is also a problem because it has the dollar, so it, can, it also lacks discipline. I think what's interesting about the change in the, since the crisis is the creation of the G20, as others have said. Why? Because the G20 potentially becomes the steering committee for the IMF and the World Bank, as the G7 was. So in the background, the dialogue where China is a member of the G20 and India and the sense of responsibility, that's where it can take place. Then it has to be reflected eventually in the institutional arrangements at the IMF. And that change is starting. I, I, I do want to say something about the role of the US here because there are so many people at a place like this Ideas Festival who have direct and indirect influence. People who are concerned about the governance issues at the IMF, especially, and the World Bank, focus a lot on the Europeans' reluctance to give up votes and voice. As Raghu said, that's not the whole story. But that's a big focus, and the Europeans are, in that sense, a problem. But the US is also a problem. And the problem is not with the administration, either past or current. It's with the Congress. And this goes back to Dave's Point, David's point about educating the American people and our politicians. The U.S. has an effective veto on many critical decisions in the IMF because they require 85 percent of the votes and the U.S. has more than 15 percent of the votes. That means certain changes that matter for 185 member countries, directly or indirectly, have to, be, have to go through certain committees in Congress. And in the last few months, it is not encouraging the kinds of discussions that have been held. I've testified several times before various subcommittees in the Congress. And I've seen the kind of torture that officials from Treasury go through in trying to, un trying to clarify why it makes sense for the US to be putting money in the IMF. Why it's not a bailout, why it's a really cheap, why it's very secure, risk-free. Um, so I think a lot of emphasis needs to be put on sort of the positive thing going on in politics in this country now, which is oh, President Obama is a globalizing president in principle. Uh, he needs support in dealing with the Congress and the American people on the need for multilateral approaches in a system where we have a, a fine, we have an economically global economy. We don't want global government, but we really only have the shadow of what you might call a global polity in the form of these international institutions. The WTO, the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, the Financial Stability Forum, all of them need to be strengthened and supported by the American people and the Congress.